everybody. We're going to get underway on time today. Um, welcome to today's lunchtime seminar. Um, my name is Diana Safati. I'm the head of the Department of Public Health. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today into this um, seminar, which will be undoubtedly very interesting. Um, the seminar today is um, from Professor Philippa Howden Chapman, whom I'm sure needs no introduction, but she is the, uh, the director of He Kainga Oranga House co-director, along with Dr. Neville Pierce, who's also sitting here. Um, I was going to say, and Centre for Sustainable Cities. So anyway, both of them, very important people in relation to housing and health. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're going to be talking about how housing affects well-being. And they're going to talk to us about um, examples from a recent stock take. Um, th this is really important because the current government is really interested in the impacts of housing on health and is also interested in well-being as a measure of, of health. So this is very timely, very relevant, and very much um, something that's likely to have an impact on policy in New Zealand. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to Neville and Philippa. I have to stand corralled here because we've got people at the other end of this machine. And um, I'd like to say that this is like the Game of Thrones, uh, but there are two thrones here because Neville and I have decided to be co-directors and we're not fighting for the Iron Throne, but we're equal thrones. So I'm going to speak for the first 20 minutes and then um, Neville's going to um, speak and we'll have a quarter of an hour questions. Okay, I'm going to talk about the state of New Zealand housing. Uh, I'm going to talk about well-being measures because, as Di intimated, um, the current government is adopting both the Treasury Living Standards Wellbeing um, uh, Report and also the OECD work. And this is very important for us in health because it changes the, um, what the government is looking for and puts us much more in line with what's happening internationally. So we'll tell you, tell you a bit about our research method, measures um, and methods. I think that's been about two years since we've updated people as to what we're doing here. Talk a bit about current research and our impact on policy. And there's, um, I won't have be able to acknowledge everyone, but there's a lot of the research team in the group, which is over and above requirements of your job. Okay, I um, before the last election, I wrote this book for Bridge and Williams Books as putting together our research and also looking um, what I thought was absolutely critical that we changed in policy and had lots of um, conversations with both um, green and um, um, red politicians. Um, I was asked to do a stock take of New Zealand housing as soon as the government got in, and this was an open book exercise. Uh, I did it with Alan Johnson. Um, basically, and it was um, commissioned um, in November and it finally came out in February and was launched in par Parliament. So I could request, we could request anything across the whole public sector, which we did, and the usual response was, well, here it is, but don't expect us to interpret it for you. So, um, and I think that's because this wellbeing framework and thinking systemically was not common across the public sector either. Um, I'm just on one slide of the main findings. I hope that some of you might be interested in going having a look at it. Home ownership, as you know, is on a 60-year low, especially for Māori and Pacifica. In fact, in almost all statistics <coughs> that we care to look at in terms of inequalities, Pacifica are worse off. Um, house price inflation is over the five past five years has been about 30%, and incomes have risen by half this rate. Uh, and 50% um, of adults owned homes in 2013. So this is a big drop. And Statistics New Zealand, who were wonderful, helped me um, check through all these figures. Now, the other thing, of course, is there's been a rapid change to renting. 70% of the 150,000 new households are actually tenants. And there's been, because there's been strong population growth, there's also been a strong demand for private rentals. Um, from picking up from Japanese prints and the uka, ukiyo, the, the fl uh, floating women, we talked about the unmeasured floating population. And this is as the state houses were sold, um, councils sold their houses, there was a turn and there was a lack of affordable housing built. There was an increase in homelessness that stayed in, uh, Kate Omore and the group had identified as her doctorate. It went from um, one in 100 
Um, it went from one in 130 to one in 100 um, by a severe housing deprivation measure by 2013. We also um, worked out, um, went to a whole lot of agencies about how many people they turned away who came for housing, and it was about nine out of 10 people turned away. So you see this pattern that um, the report, we were not to say what we thought the policy solution would be, but we had to outline the problem, rising housing related poverty, um, which um, is going very rapidly at the moment. Evictions, which I was particularly interested in following, crowding, leading to illness, stress, residential mobility, and school performance. So you can see immediately those are some of the ways in which we think in well-being. We're not just thinking about health as we have traditionally measured it. Um, we've followed a systems approach in our Centre for Sustainability um, um, work and also in Hekaiangoranga. And this I have talked about before, and this is Michael's and my work on looking at just the, the um, New Zealand Transport Survey and the Time Use Survey. We spend most of our time inside, and I know you in the room here know that homes are large, and according to Helen's work, getting larger, poorly constructed, and we're still pretty... Um, we're making small advances, but not what we had hoped. And we increasingly see both a range, range of both communicable and non-communicable diseases um, related to housing conditions. Um, and we are absolutely convinced housing is a key material factor in health inequalities. But housing, of course, is part of a complex urban city, uh, system. And we've done um, a lot of work in this area over the last 10 years, funded by MB. Uh, and there are many interesting characteristics of um, complex systems. Our scale and time frame is really important, and we can see you can get exponential growth and thing like once you don't keep um, abreast of what actually is having an influence on housing, it gets completely out of control. Uh, and the important point is that land use, housing and transport and energy need to be planned together, particularly if we're going to actually um, have some impact on reducing carbon emissions. But it's interactions between multiple parties and outcomes, and that's always more complicated. Um, some of you, I'm sure, will be aware of the four capitals. This is the well-being I referred to in the title. Um, it comes from economics, of course, um, but it, it links... Um, to more general frameworks is the natural capital um, needed the the conservation estate the green parks and cities the social capital which um, we've done quite a lot of work on and group Tony's done some work on it we've done work with the Chiro that is the um, the the social bonds and bridging bonds that people work on together and enable them to get things done. The human capital, people who come here to study and, and improve their knowledge and their skills. And then the financial and physical capital, which has been the one that previously is the only capital that Treasury has has concentrated on. And of course, under the Clark government, there was also cultural capital, um, which is the, the essence of what makes um, Aotearoa special country. Um, I've, my little semiotic um, uh, signalling here, I've been involved through the International Council's Union of looking at sustainable development goals, which we we completely ignoring in New Zealand at the moment, um, by and large, but actually very important. And they also um, highlight um, the issue that you have to be thinking about the impact of what you do on other people, on other systems, other institutions. And of course, the new budget that the government is going to be bringing in next year won't just fund a single agency, it'll be funding an outcome and people will have to work together. So I think it's a big um, step also for us thinking about research and how narrow or wide our outcomes are. Uh, so just, just to, this is the kind of um, uh, stamp just to say um, that the, this temperature is really important. These are some of the issues we've identified in housing. And I can say having just bringing the housing and health guidelines to fruition, Neville's paper is the only one in the world that actually looked at indoor and outdoor um, temperature and actually looked at health effects at the same time. So um, some of the work that we've done in New Zealand, I think is pretty up there. Uh, there's the physical pathways, and I've learned this from Julian, so Julian can give this slide. Uh, but um, of course, you know, most of our body is um, liquid and that's what responds particularly to cold. 
And the, because people are cold, they get together in one room. And this goes across actually socioeconomic groups too. Very, very little um, um, houses that have, um, what's the word I want? Cross, um, central heating, thank you, uh, across the whole house. And so we crowd together and close contact infectious diseases. Uh, this one collected people staying in bed just to keep warm. We did work about um, 12 years ago on looking at damp and mould. What happens when the home is cold? It's harder to uh, heat. And we looked at leaky homes. And after 12 years, Julian has stoically actually got an HRC grant to look at the effects of health from leaky buildings. Um, so they do matter. And the work that underpinned it, done by Caroline um, Shorter, um, where, where the mould question is, was included in the census, but I hope you all went round with your A4 bit of paper and worked out if you had mould. Um, okay, so just getting on to Hekang Oranga, um, where it was, we set it up to, after I'd done work, lots of work on inequalities, to improve the quality of housing and reduce inequalities in the determinants of health. It, it, we're, just, we're involved in lots of discussions at the moment, thinking should we continue to use that determinants language or should we shift entirely to wellbeing? So um, we've done robust community trials in partnership with place-based and Maori communities. Ours is a multidisciplinary team and that's part of the pleasure of it, work with physicists, um, mycologists, um, experts in Māori and Pacific health, um, social scientists, epidemiologists and epidemiologists, biostatisticians. Uh, so we are a multidisciplinary team with transdisciplinary goals. We've had about 30 doctoral students um, gone through both our groups and um, actually so we have a number of people who've come back to work with us. Um, we're funded by the, this, the eight Hekaianga Oranga is funded by the HRC trusts and companies, and we're now working very closely with the sustainable development goals and wellbeing frameworks. But we've worked for a long time on the idea of co-benefits, and um, so it's converging. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to talk about all these things, but I'm just highlighting this in terms of wellbeing. If you look just at the red there, the insulation one, um, which is like you know increasing the um, capacity of the residential building to keep the heat inside. The heating ones, um, heating vouchers that Helen's doing, hippie study that Michael Keel has done, uh, the nest study, um, which Caroline has again done, well home study, which um, uh, Neville's going to talk about, the rental warrant of fitness that Lucy's and Julie have done, housing first, Neville's going to talk about, and work I'm not going to talk about today, but we're very proud of the active study where we look at a, a policy happening, model communities, money giving to Hastings and to New Plymouth to actually do cycle and walkways, and we did a quasi-experimental study, which we went back for four times interviewing the same people to see if they lived close to a cycleway and walkway, would they, in fact, um, would they be more likely to cycle and walk? Uh, and the road study, which um, Caroline um, Shaw is doing, indoor and outdoor air quality. Okay, this photo, dear to my heart, first time we went around talking at Hui's, this is in, in um, Mahia. Uh, and basically we found insulation, this is summarizing three, close to four years work, improves health, uh, significant improvement in self-reported health, fewer days off school, less wheeze and colds, fewer hospital admissions. That was a trend. We didn't have enough people to show the significance of that. And a positive benefit to cost ratio of two to one. Now, this actually showed that it also, because there was a reduction in energy and that had an effect on carbon emissions, this was the first time we worked with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in the, in the previous Labour government. And this was brought in, was actually partly a prototype of well-being because it wasn't just in health, it was went across all these other sectors. Uh, and then we did one, a heating one, because we were only just took, got the temperature up to 17 degrees. This was again a randomised community trial. And we were basically, we were concentrating on children with asthma now. And we were trying to get rid of these horrible old heaters and get ones that were effective, heat pumps, wood pellet burners, or fluid gas heaters. And this is a slightly younger Neville. <laughs> 
you haven't got any grey on your hair yet. And my husband behind Rafe, who did, and this is where we always went out to Kokiri Morai, we did it all around the country. We have food, this is people choosing what kind of heater they want, um, and which they didn't have to pay for. We found money for that. And this, the heating results of this, which like the previous one were in the BMJ, showed more effective heaters increased the indoor temperature, improved children's asthma symptoms, and with work, um, going around to schools, we found fewer days of school and fewer visits to GPs. So on the, taken together, these were one of our big coups actually of, this was the largely along with some stuff that brands had done, um, was formed the basis of the Warm Up New Zealand Heat Smart program, which was a $320 million program and is just being revitalized um, again at the moment. We looked at the first 100,000 houses in the first two years of program based on work that Lucy had done. Um, we quasi experimental study, we matched the anonymized matching of the first 46,000 houses that had been insulated. And we did this with Arthur Grimes at Moto and Nick Praval, who was here. Uh, well, there was a small but significant drop in metered energy, but we, because we had now about a quarter of a million people, we sh were able to show that there were significant health outcomes in pharmaceutical usage, length of hospitalization, avoidable mortality for over 65s, and that was the cost-benefit ratio for children and older people of six to one. So we're, we're getting, you know, two to one as we get greater power, we get six to one. And the, the actually the active journeys of cycleways and walkways is 10 to one. Uh, Michael did a similar staggered intervention in, um, in Taranaki. This was in the Lancet, it was carried out with the ACC. We get a very high response rate in New Zealand. And um, this was sending around a delightful young um, builder $600 he had for budget for each house, and he remediated uh, the, the um, remediated uh, the hazards and the injury rates, and looked at the ACC cleans. I'm looking at here. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, so there's a 26 reduction percent reduction in the rate of falls and injuries each year. That is because most people who go to hospital with injuries injure themselves in their home, not in the football field, not in the mountains. And there was a 39 percent of reduction in rate of injury specific to home modifications. We've actually, this is quite, this is, I could go on at length about this because actually ACC went under another track on the previous government and they're extremely uninterested in these results. And yet in a well-being framework, you would think that this enables them to actually save money. So we, that's a work in progress trying to help um, make this argument to them too. Strips and falls and on the thing and the paper um, that we had in the Lancet. Uh, we did a rental warrant of fitness. Now we are getting evidence about what things make a difference. And we worked with five councils. We've trained assessors. Julie developed an app. And we did a quasi-experimental pilot. The trouble was we were so effective at saying this was important that it became government policy and we have the Healthy Homes Guarantee um, Act. So we're now working out other ways in which we might kind of monitor this. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is evictions. I've been interested in this for a long while. I did originally did a literature degree and um, really interested in painting. And um, I had an opportunity recently in Paris to um, pop into the Musée d'Orsay. And this is called The Resigned One, so painting from 1901 of people, and this is, this is part of a genre of paintings, people just waiting for events to overwhelm them or they're waiting at death's door. And it's, it's very um, poignant. Now, this is the house at the end of the street where they've been selling pea. Some of you might miss it or miss the cannabis. There are up to 60 people waiting every day. Finally, the police came and said, actually, clear the tenants out as we'll, um, we'll um, confiscate your... Um, capital because you're that this is to the landlord you're aiding and abetting the sale of pea so all the stuff got um, dumped out and if you want to buy a 14 bedroom house uh which hasn't been manufacturing pea but it's been there you're welcome to come to Marama crescent this is on my way to work i've increasingly seen this i can't actually oh here there's um there, on the side of this picture you see little ch children's shoes um, this was here for about a week. Someone's just dumped everybody's house, um, stuff outside of a house. And, of course, we know that 
um, uh, under P, um, where under the, the very, very unreasonably low standards that Housing New Zealand felt they had to adhere to, pushed by the previous minister, um, people were evicted with three days' notice and were told that they had to destroy all their property, um, or or else while they were out of the house, it was all thrown into um, bins. So eviction is as traumatic now in some ways as it was back in the 19th centuries when they were doing the clearances in, in, in Scotland, which brought lots of our ancestors here, uh, and um, or when they were doing the enclosures. Okay, so this is my last slide before I pass over to my distinguished colleague. This is eviction and its consequences. This is where we applied for a Marsden and got a Marsden fund. Representation, discourse and reality. That's why, it's blue skies, that's why we can use posh language. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Desmond's book had come out on eviction, and he, he himself had been evicted as a young man, and it's a wonderful book. Uh, and one of the sentences from that, he says, it's the most understudied process affecting the urban poor, despite its central part in reproducing urgent marginality. It's multidisciplinary. Ben here is in the group. Lucy's in it. We're working with Bridget Toy Cronin from the Socio Legal Centre. It's um, Marsden funded, as I said. It's We're looking at historical representations of evictions in art and novels. Ben's looking at archival history. We're looking at the current legal rules and processes. Sarah Bear is involved in it and her husband, Mark Bennett, who's in um, the Victoria Law School. Analyze from comparative and socio-legal perspective. It's a really fascinating project. And Lucy's doing IDI monitoring of what we can tell about the impacts of eviction on households. And we're analyzing what groups are most affected by it evictions, exploring both tenants and landlords' perceptions of eviction. And Lucy is a covert landlord, and she's um, doing blogs on the landlord's page too, so, which you have to join in. Um, so we're, we're following in many ways what's happening here. Oh. And while he's getting up, this is just where particularly... <laughs> Particularly interested, we're interested in children, and I was on this um, the children's commission of the group, and we recognise that um, many children are now in poverty are in private rentals, and the work on these twenty eight thousand children Neville's going to talk to you about now, and we think this is connected to schooling again, to health, and worse things. Yeah, no, we know it's connected to schooling, having shown it in a paper with Sarah Free. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's one of those, um, and what we're describing here is a systematic problem, a systematic problem of housing, and it's linking in with urban development and um, how we treat how we treat low income people and low income communities, um, and how what their well being is. Um, Twenty eight thousand children are hospital are admitted to hospital each year for housing related diseases. It's one of the things we found that's quite shocking. Um, and that's caused by the very short length of stay in rental tenure and the very poor quality of rental tenure houses. Um, prevent, we're, one of our projects, Well Homes, is looking at, and this is work I did with Jane and Oliver and Michael Baker, we looked at these, um, these 28,000 children who are hospitalised for housing-related diseases, um, and they're the middle lines here. The black line is any child who comes into a New Zealand ho uh, hospital and their chances of coming back to hospital. It takes them about, uh, on average, 15 years for a rehospitalization. Um, unfortunately, for children who are hospitalized for housing-related diseases, it's three times that rate. And for children hospitalized with what the ministry call housing-sensitive hospitalizations, it's four times the rate. Um, shockingly, it's not only hospitalizations we can see this. We can see this in children's deaths as well. But it's a whole it's a whole systems problem. Fortunately, it's very rare for any child admitted to a New Zealand hospital to die. It's very rare for a New Zealand child to die. Um, but for the people who are admitted with housing sensitive hospitalizations, they die at ten times the rate of the children admitted for anything else. Um, so since two thousand, that's five hundred and sixty excess deaths in the children who are been admitted for um, in the in that group of children who have been admitted for housing related housing sensitive hospitalizations. So it's a real indication. This isn't causation, and it's not just housing causing it, but it's a systems failure for those kids. Um, and we do have the 
unfortunate case of Emilita Vaughan where the coroner actually said the house did it. For most of these, it isn't the case the house did it. It's society and um, the lack of well-being um, killed them. One of the things we're looking at when we're trying to solve this very much is uh, with well homes, and that's uh, the two DHBs, uh, community providers and GPs. We now have automated referrals coming in to, from <clears throat> all children hospitalized in the hut and um, in the hospital here. Um, uh, automatically, if you come in with a housing-sensitive hospitalization, we'll send a notification to well homes, and well homes will ring you and ask, is, <clears throat> ask about the quality of your home and do you want somebody to see you. Then our community partners, Cokery and Sustainability Trust, are coming out, and they're having um, a look at the house, and they're saying, what are the points that need to be, what are the points of intervention we need here? From a sustainability and a health point of view, how to make this house work better um, for the people in it. Um, <clears throat> and then we're delivering those interventions with money from the Hut Manor Charitable Trust, of which we've raised over 400,000. Um, shocking, uh, unsurprisingly, the, uh, our referrals into well homes and the children coming in with housing related diseases have a huge socioeconomic gradient um, and are very. Uh, <coughs> it's, just obvious that this is poverty uh, in New Zealand, and this is child poverty in New Zealand. Um, well Homes is free, um, and this is what these are the main interventions we're delivering, uh, most of which we knew about and we were well able to plan for, insulation, heating, curtains, minor repairs for the safety and steps. Um, Housing New Zealand have really played ball in this, and this is one of our projects where they've really stepped up to the plate, and they have been fixing their houses where we've identified problems. It's been, they've been slower about where the, somebody needs, and a family needs an entirely new house, but they're trying. Uh, we also work with work and income, which is kind of hard. Um, one of the things that really surprised me, um, and took me a bit by surprise, was beds and bedding. We kind of had to add this in. Of the 1,400 homes we've seen, 1,200, we had to replace, the, replace or give beds and bedding. Some people, many kids don't have beds or don't have bedding. What they have there is generally moldy and it's a condition of the home, moldy and damp. Um, we are taking quite a lot of kids out of hospital wards where they're clean and dry and putting them into moldy beds. We're doing this for kids as young as zero days old. Um, fortunately, the new Prime Minister's baby will probably be going home to a clean, dry room um, that's warm, but it's not the case for all New Zealanders. Um, one of the other problems we have um, is homelessness, and this is a, a chronic problem and very much on the government's radar. Uh, good, excellent work by Kate has shown that uh, one in 100 New Zealanders is, uh, fits the definition of homelessness. Um, this is a uh, an emergency, really. Um, the MSD social housing waiting list has gone up 62% in the past two years when we had to update this slide. Um, MSD doesn't even record the, um, the initial inquiries. It just has this form and it's quite difficult to get through um, and you have to book to um, make your appointments beforehand. Um, so we're internationally the answer to this and the answer to chronic rough sleeping is housing first. That's giving people the choice, um, putting, them in, putting them in permanent sustainable housing straight away as a first step and dealing with the other problems then that come around chronic homelessness. Um, a little bit like some of our other stuff, the government has now committed 67 million to funding Housing First while we're still in the process of developing the research program. <laughs> so I'm very much tied into doing this. Um, <clears throat> so our, our research program is we've been we've had our together with our partners the people's project in Hamilton we've housed 401 formerly homeless people and um, we've gotten their NHIs and linked them all to the linked them to the IDI we've had 97 and a half percent successfully linked um, linking data in New Zealand and our data is really strong particularly the IDI um, but the real difference is, can we show that this two and five years down the road has made a huge difference? Um, like I said, it's now being rolled out um, as a program, but we have just housed the people, so we have to wait two to five years to get our results. Um, it's been funded by MB. Um, and this is, um, I just wanted to talk briefly about the IDI because it goes through a lot of our projects now, and it's about how we're trying to do things. Um, and this is finding an identity, finding... <coughs> Finding something that works, finding an intervention that you want to test, and then recording just who the intervention was on, when it happened, where it happened, uh, and somehow measures about how it went through so as you can look back later. Then 
just matching the people who you've done your intervention on to the IDI. So in the Hamilton case, we've housed 401 people, and then we have a co we have the Auckland City Mission database of 10,000 people who weren't housed at the same time. And we're looking at and the differences in the outcomes across health. So we have the hospitalization data set, mortality, pharmaceutical usage. Um, horrifically, for people who are living on the streets, for our 400 people on the streets of Hamilton, the year before they were housed, they had 12,000 filled pharmaceutical prescriptions for 400 people. Um, so we certainly are capable of supplying them with drugs. Whether we're capable of supplying them with housing is another matter. Um, <clears throat> for MSD, we're looking across the benefits and what benefits they're on and how this changes uh, as they better engage with social services. We're looking at the justice sector pipeline, um, as it's called, um, which is a bit offensive. But actually, both sides of this homelessness are really um, feature heavily in the offenders, but also as the victims of crime. If you're living on the streets of New Zealand, you're extremely vulnerable. Uh, and hopefully tax and employment. Um, so this is what this is the picture we're trying to create. This is for our 401 people. This is their hospitalization history going back 30 years. Um, this shows basically a high sustained rate of hospitalization over a 20 year period from 25 to five years before they were before they were housed. And then as the whole group tends into homelessness, um, uh, drastic um, drastic health problems that come along with being homeless and cause both are both a cause and a consequence of homelessness. Uh, my big question is what happens next after we house them? And this I honestly don't know, but I have a very strong feeling that housing homeless people is part of the solution to homelessness. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you want to talk about? You want to finish this up? I'm just going to. Uh, we're pulling it all together, on our end, particularly with Cheryl Davies, who's our great partner in 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 Wainui and Mata in the Hut, and He Tipu Monahoa Resilient Plant. Um, and this is a partnership between the Marae Trust, Haikang Oranga, Housing in New Zealand, to improve the quality of the one, uh, housing in the Wainui and Mata community. So it's a shared equity slash or rental thing with Housing New Zealand um, building above code, and uh, it's very exciting. And also in an attempt to make sure the houses are easily reach 18 degrees, um, we have a coalition of um, the energy sector um, Transpower, Meridian and Wellington Electricity who are going to be putting photovoltaics actually on the whare kai, um, on the kohanga reo there and on the houses and they're interested in uh, having a smart grid on the edge of the grid and it will be a demand reduction thing. And Ian Shearer here, a wonderful engineer, has been helping us with that. Okay, last slide. Um, so housing and health uh, uh, and wellbeing a significant economic, environmental, political, and public health issues. So I think in health, and particularly those of us in public health who thought a lot about determinants, I think we need to think a lot about well-being too. Um, we can and have made a difference through robust studies, and I'd like to acknowledge particularly the directors who are here, Michael Baker, um, um, Julian Crane, and, and Neville, and actually Tony was involved in our first insulation study. Uh, we know that warmer, safer houses improve health and well-being, lower hospitalisation and deaths in children and older people. Counting co-benefits co and the system is, is aligns with the sustainable development goal and well-being frameworks, and the use, as many people in this room know, of the integrated data infrastructure in increases the policy reach and the relevance. Um, and I um, actually just called into the Ministry of Transport today to, to, so to um, talking at their next board meeting of their collection of boards because health is seen to have done this ahead of lots of um, health researchers and a lot of different other sectors. Broad government policies need, needed across housing, transport and integrated urban land use to reduce inequalities and increase the sustainable green economy. Thank you. Thank you very much for those fascinating presentations. I'll say a little bit more at the end, but for now, let's open it up for questions. Tony. Great presentation. Um, good stuff, guys. Uh, 
Neville, it's great to see you've been a Bayesian having a prior, but housing people might be the solution to homelessness. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I have a question. The 400 people in Hamilton, yep. when you home them, um, um, you know what I'm going to ask, is the comparator group is in another city. Was there any chance to do some randomization here? I, I, the effect size is going to be big, but just curious as to the, um, the comparator group. Um, so the comparator group we're fiddling around with a little bit. We have the entire Auckland City Mission uh, database on there. We're looking at 1,200 people in that who are classified as home in particular. So we're, we're focusing on, we, I haven't done it yet, but I'm looking at the 1,200 of those who are classified on their database as homeless. Um, so it would probably meet the criteria. I do have the problem of Auckland versus Hamilton, but it would be it would be difficult and hard to run. Actually, the, the People's Project did were housing people, and I would have loved to have done a randomized control trial. It has, in Canada, where they did it, they had to do it by centers, because if you have people show up uh, at an NG, community NGO, they tend to prioritize people, no matter what your randomization does. So I was happier, I, I was ha I'm happy enough that it's reasonable evidence, but it's not perfect, and it's not a randomized control trial, but it's probably not the thing to do with homelessness. It's not as easy as a drug. And they don't have fences around them, so they're mm. basically, we know that there's a lot of people mm. going backwards and forwards between Hamilton and Auckland. Oh. Question. Question for Philippa. Um, in the last 10 years, there's been a huge amount of retrofitted insulation in houses. Mm. Have you made any aggregative measures of the impact of this on New Zealand health? Uh, it's interesting you should ask that question <laughs> from someone very knowledgeable. We are actually in the process of doing this. and um, We're doing a burden of disease study about um, changes that have occurred, um, we think, from each of the separating out things like that. And Lucy's also, um, at this very moment, thinking about putting a research application in to look at um, seeing if it affects deaths over a long period. So uh, it's a question we're asked frequently, particularly in a, in a different way by the media. Well, what if we had really good houses in New Zealand? So the, the, the idealistic or the aspirational counterfactual, what would be the impact on hospitalisation and energy consumption and children at school and so forth? So we, that's the question we want to answer too. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, the great, great presentation. The issue of uh, focusing on determinants or well-being, you sort of uh, even maybe hinted that even both might be a, a combined approach may be feasible. Can you comment a bit more on that? Because it, that influences, you know, everything in this, in our public health department. Yeah. Do you want to say what you think? I'd be interested. Uh, no, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm generally um, genuinely interested. I, I mean, we had a salutary experience recently because we wrote what we thought was the best research grant we'd written, and it and it didn't even get through the first round of MB because we did it on well-being and housing, work, well-being and urban regeneration, and so. And you can tell moving around the different agencies, some of them don't, um, don't, haven't really clicked with it at all. Others, like the Ministry of Transport, were already thinking that way and they're really excited about it. I, I just think determinants is quite, um, it's quite siloed, even though we think about interactions and um, you know, control for this thing and control for the other. Whereas the sort of sustainable development goals and and um, the world beings enable you to look at individual factors, contextual factors, and in different parts of the economy in a, in a, in a, in a sense a more interesting way and in a way which means that we, you know, um, those of us who went round to the just other agencies when we were sort of completely fixated on reducing inequalities, it completely, most of the people in the agencies were, look, you know, we've got lots of things to do, you're obsessed by that, whereas this connects much more with the, I think the population and the economy as a whole. But it's, I think we've got a lot of work to do to still make it seem um, robust science. Here it means Sarah. 
Um, the problem that I can see with removing structural determinants of health and replacing it with well-beings is that structural determinants includes a whole way of understanding causation and understanding the factors that one can then separate out and think about differently and it can relate to the individual level and, and it can relate to co the cultural and social construction of the individual as well. Um, and I'm at a loss to see I mean, it seems to me in terms of inequality, isn't there a chance that what's actually really being resisted is the fundamental kind of idea that the problem is poverty and that once you get well-being to the point where it appears rigorous and it's really starting to say things about that, the same people might then reject that as well? Um, th that's an interesting comment and I still have, um, I mean, Nick expressed, picked up my ambivalence quite clearly because this is clearly a very long and distinguished group of people who've, who've looked at determinants and, you know, going back to Marx and before and Durkheim and, uh, and you don't have that with well-being and so it seems sort of poetic in a way. So I, 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 do, I do think that we, we, we have some work to um, ensure that they're rigorous and as you say, it may be it just nicely puts pushes it away a bit, sort of fundamental issues. On the other hand, it may enable us to step outside of health and really engage with Ministry of Social Development, who is doing Ministry of Transport, MB, um, and people are coming to us a lot to have those conversations. No, they weren't. We were completely silent towards us for the previous decade. But uh, who knows? I think I think that we should have that we should get probably some, you know, one of these sessions, get some people in who are working in the public sector and wellbeing and and really have a good discussion about it. There are a few. Do you still have questions here? Please. Thanks. Well, a big congratulations on the policy success that you've seen so far. It has me curious as to what you would like to see done further. Is it expansion of existing programs or some new policy avenues? <laughs> um, so it's a big question. Um, uh, so actually, a lot of these, uh, most of the problems we're talking about are interconnected and it's trying to get a whole of government approach to housing in particular, but uh, society and poverty and the things that are intimately related with the housing crisis we have in New Zealand. Um, we need to raise the standard of housing um, and we need to raise the standard of equality um, quite substantially. Um, and that, um, that just has to be done. So we'd really like to see work in that. The new government is much, much better than the old one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and the language, the language and the talking and the interconnect, and you can see the public service trying to get and move in this direction and they're trying to be pushed in this direction. But it is a long, tough haul. Um, to go back to housing in particular, they're trying to build 100,000 houses, which would be a good start and get part of the way. Um, and they're trying to, they're trying actively to deal with homelessness. And you can see the big change in strategy to housing first and to dealing with housing as part of a continuum, um, or uh, dealing with housing as part of a, a broader social problem is working, or should work well, hopefully. Um, yeah, and moving away from exclusion, which was a previous, um, um, yes, and um, I, I think it would be really good to have a, a number of us have a, um, given submissions at the UNCROC committee, um, United Nations Cultural um, Educational One, which we have to appear at every year, every two years, and it's, they've been quite, I don't know if you read the responses that came out, they're very, very critical of New Zealand, and work that like Amanda's done, it, I, we think it's really important that New Zealand actually engages with these frameworks so that we can start to compare ourselves with Sweden and um, Netherlands um, and so forth, and really feel proud to lift our rankings. So that would be one thing, engaging with the sustainable development goals. They're kind of abstract. The practical thing is where so much research by us and other people points out that 
rental housing is that it's still appalling in New Zealand and um, it's you have to take what you're given really and you can be kicked out the next month and we um, we're really 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 keen to to um, to lift those standards and hopefully the, we, we've just assumed standards in New Zealand we we think that they're not important we've got leaky building you know we've got pooling um, rental properties and you can see it you know we don't keep we don't enforce any of them across the whole economy and that's something we would really like to see showing that if we if there are evidence informed standards and then if necessary regulations you can see the benefits of that and that's the changes that we'd really like to come about I think that's a very good um, point at which to draw this session to a close. I just want to say that just sort of sitting listening to this presentation, I had all these words starting with I kind of leaping to mind, like innovative and interesting and, um, and uh, important, inspiring. They all start with I. The, the work, I think, is, is um, you know, it's, it's outstanding in particular in relation to the fact that it's genuinely multidisciplinary, it's generally, genuinely multi-sector, it's genuinely solutions focused and focused on the most vulnerable in our communities and it is so highly policy relevant that I think it really is outstanding. So I'd like to thank both Philippa and Neville for their work and the team for their work and for this presentation today. Thank you very much.